Welcome to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings. Not just highlighting their successes, but more focusing on the road they travel to get there. Now this week's guest, I chose to bring him on because he's doing such positive things in the community and he has shown himself to be a true role model and leader in helping our people to gain mortgages and learn more about the financial side of everything in life and helping us to acquire wealth and acquire property. Please welcome to this week's Power Move Makers, Mr. Matt Garland, AKA MG, the mortgage guy. Sean, thank you, brother. I appreciate the opportunity to be on your platform, man. Thank you so much for having me here, man. Looking forward to having a great conversation with you. Now, nah, thanks for taking time out. I love your platform. I love all of the information that you are giving back to our community. I thought it was just necessary, especially in this time of COVID. It, it, it's a lot of unsurety going around, not just in our community, but around in the world. And I felt there would be no better person to help educate our community or how they can acquire wealth, how, can, how they can acquire real estate than yourself. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it, man. Look, you're a legend, man. So like I said, man, I'm truly humbled and honored to be, to be on your platform, man. So thank you, man. And whatever I can do to help the community, I'm all for it. Thank you, brother. So let's jump right into it. COVID, it's a bad time for everybody. Mm -hmm. Are there any opportunities? You know, yourself being in the financial services industry for, first off, how long have you been in the financial services industry? So I've been, I've been a loan officer for 18 years now. Um, so been in this game. I've, I've been here uh, before, during the wild cowboy days. That's what I like to call a subprime mortgage crisis. You know, I, I survived the Great Recession. And um, now we're here during the pandemic. So, um, you know, my career has been filled with ups and downs <laughs> as far as the economy is concerned. And um, it's, been a, it's, been a great, it's been a great ride, man. So, um, yeah, so the pandemic is something that's been crazy. Um, now we're coming on, what, three, four months um, of COVID-19, and we're finally now starting to reopen, but we still see um, in certain states, the cases are starting to rise. So, um, you know, it's been kind of terrible from that perspective of people getting sick, people losing their lives. Um, but in every crisis, there's opportunities, right? And there's opportunities for- Speaking people. my language, Matt. There's always opportunities. You can never waste a good crisis, as they say, right? Um, so these are opportunities. If you if you look at it from the the glasses half full perspective versus is half empty, you can find ways where you can really use this time to either learn or to grow, right? Um, there's a lot of people that are in the learning stage, and I think. COVID actually helped so many people kind of settle down, take a back seat, you know, and kind of realign their life, right? And, and to continue to learn and what is about real estate, stocks, you know, whatever the case may be during this COVID. And there's so many people that are now making money in the stock market, buying real estate today because of what they learned during this quarantine. So it's been, um, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. But I think this is a great opportunity for everybody to, to get their piece of the pie right now. Okay, so question for you. You brought up the Great Recession. We're talking mm -hmm. 06, 07, 08, 09. How right. is it different? Then in terms of what? As far as getting financed or just in general? No, two, two, two things. Number one, in terms of getting financed, financed and the housing market plummeting overall. Well, in terms of getting financed and during the wild cowboy days, I mean, look, you didn't really need to provide any documentation to get loans. I mean, look, if you had a pulse, you can get a mortgage back then, right? Um, it was pretty easy. So when the market um, started to um, crash, so to speak, you know, it, it was difficult housing because people couldn't really afford the, the homes that they were purchasing. You know, you were able to purchase four, five, six, seven properties all within the same time frame because the technology that we have today didn't exist back in 06, 7, 8. And, and for not for nothing, 
the banks really didn't care. They wasn't regulating because on Wall Street, people were buying, investors were buying that paper, right? But once those investors stopped buying that paper um, from, from, from banks, then, you know, they start cutting back on those programs and people took out a lot of risky mortgages, like adjustable rate mortgages, two-year fix, one-year fix rate mortgages just to get into the home. And then those, those um, programs had a lot of balloon payments. So people really couldn't afford their homes back then. Fast forward to now, um, with all the new regulation that came in during the Obama administration, now we're checking everything. We want your firstborn. We want your blood type. You know, we're documenting, documenting, over-documenting to make sure your ability to repay is, is there. So to, in today's market, Sean, people can actually afford to buy the homes that they're purchasing. Obviously, you're always going to have people that are still over-leveraged. Um, because the way lenders approve people, we go off the gross income, not your net income. So there's always going to be cases where people over leverage, but in the most part, people can afford the homes that they're buying today. Um, home prices, believe it or not, haven't, haven't decreased during COVID. You know, a lot of talk came out. And, and, and that's, that, that was the second part of my question is, is mm -hmm. the housing market, the real estate market overall, you're it's, on, it's on fire. Really? It's on, it's on fire, bro. Like COVID didn't stop anything. If anything, it slowed us down a little bit, right? So now you have um, stay-at-home orders, so you can't do construction, right? You have um, appraisers. Appraisers couldn't go into people's homes, but the government came out with guidelines where said, okay, you could do a drive-by appraisal, right? You have the court systems. They are closed down. So when you order in title reports, you can't get certain things from, um, you know, back from the court system, Right. It takes a little while longer because people are working from home. So it slowed us up, but it didn't slow down, right? People were still out there buying homes. Like this past four months has been the busiest I've ever been in my 18-year career, like ever. How is, okay, break this down for me. And keep in mind, I'm no real estate expert. I don't mm -hmm. do what you do. I'm not a loan officer. And a lot of people who watch my program, you know, they're entry level. How, how is this even possible, what you're saying? Well, again, although tens of millions of Americans lost their job, mm -hmm. I think the un, at its height, it went up to what, 14, 15%. But you still got 85% of people out there, right? <laughs> when you really think about these numbers. So when, when you hear it on the media, oh, 30 million, 40 million people lost their jobs, there's 330 million, 400 million people in America. So when you really think about that number, although it is high, right? That number is small in comparison to the amount of people that are still out there working. Um, folks were, were, the real estate market was on fire prior to COVID-19. Coming into 2020, it was already set to break records. There was some markets that was due for a correction, maybe slow down, like in a luxury market in New York City, that kind of slowed down over the past year, two years things like that. But when you're talking to everyday home buyer, right, that 100,000 to in New York, the everyday home buyer, probably seven, 800,000 because of multifamilies, mm -hmm. those buyers, those are the, the blue collar workers. That's your transit, your nurses, you know, those folks that have that, that job security, they're still out here buying, right? Because they're, they're essential workers. They still have their jobs and now they're making more money because of overtime that they're doing. So those folks are out there still buying. You still have a lot of businesses out there that wasn't affected by COVID. There's a lot of people that's in the digital space right now that are making a killing. They're out there buying real estate. So the market didn't, like I said, crumble. It didn't crash. And some parts of the country, Sean, during COVID, home prices actually went up. Wow. Like, it's incredible. You still have homes going above asking prices in some markets. I mean, there's homes that go on the market right now, certain markets like Atlanta, for example. Atlanta, you put a house, a good house on the market in Atlanta, that thing is off the market 24 hours later. It's not going to last. Like, it's incredible right now. So, and then you couple that right now with low interest rates. Interest rates have been the, are the lowest they've ever been since yeah, they've been can we, can we take a second and talk about where the interest rates today? Whew. Right now, depending on credit score, the program type, um, but if you're doing like a traditional like FHA loan, which is for primarily mostly first time home buyers, use FHA because you can put as little as 3.5% down. Uh -huh. um, you need a minimum right now of a 620 credit score. Prior to COVID, 580 credit score was the, the, the minimum. 
but we we went as high during COVID up to 660. But right now, as we started reopening, it started dropping back down. Now we're at 620, right? You can probably get a, a home right now if you have a 660 credit score. You know, buying a multifamily in New York, New Jersey, you can probably get yourself 2.75, somewhere around there, on a 30-year fix. You got to think about that. On a 30-year fix, 2.75. Yes, 2.75. And I've, I've locked in people lower than that. You know, I've locked in someone. I, I just locked in my best friend. He just closed on the house, 2.6. You know, I have somebody I just locked in with a multifamily on an FHA loan, 2.5%, right? I mean, I have people buying million-dollar homes right now getting 2.8 to 3%. Like, I, I, I'm I talking to somebody right before this call, before we got on, <laughs> $1.2 million home. The rate is like 3%, bro. Like, it's it's incredible. The money is almost free. That's insane. So, People are so your 18 years of doing this. Is this the actual lowest you've ever seen these interest rates? Lowest ever. Lowest okay, you lived ever. through you lived through the Great Recession. Yes, sir. Did they go this low during no. those bad Hell no. years? Hell no. When I purchased my first home, mm -hmm. I was at seven and a quarter. Wow. And I was I was two what years. Year was that? that was 2005. So you purchased right at the front end of the recession. Right in the front end. Didn't know nothing. Didn't, didn't know a damn thing about what I was doing, right? I came into business. Um, my best friend told me, like, hey, I was working at TSA, got laid off. He said, hey, why don't you go and do loans? I said, what's a loan? What's a mortgage? I didn't even know what a mortgage was, bro. <laughs> like, real talk. I'm being honest. I had no clue. He was like, you know, when people buy a house, you need a mortgage. I'm like, okay, bet. I looked in the paper because that AOL dial-up was too slow. So I looked in the daily news, and I got in the daily news, and I saw people were advertising for these loan officer jobs. I'm like, okay, this looks like I can do this. I can talk to people. And I went on a couple of interviews, and I never looked back. You okay, know, stop there. Stop there. What are okay. the qualifications to become a loan officer? Back then, you need no qualifications. You could be straight, off, straight out of jail and get a job as a loan officer. Are you kidding like, me? There was no qualifications. There was no regulation. There was no licensing for loan officers. So there was no, I got to have a four-year degree. There was no, none of that? None of that, bro. Okay, none what about today? That. Today, now you got to get licensed. Now you got to go through a 25-hour class um, that's going to teach you all the laws. You got to pass that class. Once you pass that class, then you got to take a federal exam. Once you pass that federal exam, then you got to do a background check. Fingerprints got to be on file. All with the FBI. Everything is is rules and regulated now right so they got they do credit checks on you make sure that your credit is in good standing i mean even if you have collections on your credit report they want to make sure like listen are you, what are you doing with this are you going to pay this what's going on here right if you have child support problems if you have back taxes they want to know that okay you're in some sort of payment arrangement what's going on here so now you you have to be checked and we have to do continuing education every single year now to keep our license in. So it's a completely different process um, for loan officers. Like real estate agents always had to be licensed, but not loan officers. So when we came in this bit, when I came in this business, that's why I call it the wild cowboy days. Like if anybody's seen that movie, Boiler Room. Boiler Room. Right? It's one yep, of my favorite yep. movies of all time. I love Boiler Room. That's how it was when I first came to business. You got these guys, they got the Lamborghinis, they got the Ferraris, they got the custom suits, you got the Italians, you got the Jews, you got a sprinkle of black folks, right? But mostly you see Italians, Jewish guys, white guys, and they're just making all this money and they're teaching you how to really bang people out. It wasn't about relationships. It wasn't about helping somebody get to that next level. For me, how I was brought in this business, everybody was a dollar sign. And that's how I was taught, right? So when you when I first came to this business, I'm just on the phone, smiling and dialing, right? Smiling and dialing all day long, like I, like it's a boiler room. Like seriously, three, four, five hundred calls a day, um, just getting people on the phone and talking about mortgages. And that's how I came into business. That's how I learned. But I didn't know anything. I just knew I was I was nice on the phone, and I had some game, right? And I knew how to convince people why they should work with me. It's not until the crash happened and I lost everything, right? Because I was uneducated. The people who didn't look like me were telling me I should save my money. I shouldn't be out here buying cars. I shouldn't be out here going to Vegas, going crazy. I shouldn't be buying all this jewelry. Again, like we had this conversation before this call, 
I idolized drug dealers and um, athletes growing up. Mm-hmm. So when I got some money, all I wanted to do was look like what I saw in my life like, that, that I couldn't afford, right? I couldn't afford that stuff then. So now I can afford it. I'm going to buy it. Purchase homes and things of that nature. Um, invested in real estate while I was there, but I didn't really understand what I was doing, right? So when the, when the crash, I didn't understand the market. So when the signs were there that something was major was about to happen, I ignored it. Because for me, it was like money was growing on trees. So when the crash happened, I lost several properties because I just didn't know what I was doing. And that humbled me. The universe humbled me. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life is when the universe humbled me and it made me realize, all right, there got to be a different way. This can't be the way you go about doing this business. And um, in 2010, I got an opportunity to go work for J.P. Morgan Chase, and it was probably the best thing I ever did for my career because, and I tell people this all the time, and that's why I'll say their name with no problem because I give them a lot of credit because that's when I first got my first training. That's when I learned how to become a professional. That's when I, that's when I tell people this all the time. That's when I got my MBA in mortgage banking. I learned how to deepen relationships, customer service, how to, how to pipeline management, you know, all these good things that they don't teach us, right? They don't yep. teach us in high school. They don't even teach you this in college, right? This is real world experience. And until, and, and at this time, I'm what, six years, seven years in the business, and I didn't know any of this stuff. So I was running around like a chicken with his head cut off, not knowing what the hell was going on. And when I spent that four years at J.P. Morgan, that's kind of when I learned everything that I'm doing right now. You know, I worked on Wall Street for two of those four years. And when I worked on Wall Street, that's when I, I realized how the other side plays, right? When you got the hedge, fund, the hedge fund managers, the bankers, the traders, when these guys got life insurance, trusts, estates, you know, LLCs, S-Corps, like what is all of this stuff, right? I'm like, I'm seeing these guys' tax returns and I'm seeing all this. I'm like, why are you, what is this? Mm-hmm. And then they started educating me and that's when I finally started listening. Like, wait a minute, this is different. This is not how I was talking to my clients in 2003, four, five, six. Our clientele was just so happy to get into a house that they were not thinking about generational wealth. Correct. Where, where these folks on Wall Street, all they were doing, their whole setup was all about generational wealth. And then that's when I started having different conversations within our community um, before all the social media stuff is just start telling people, hey, you need life insurance. If you're going to buy a house, why not get this term insurance? It's only 50 bucks. If something happens, it's going to be paid for. Your house is going right. to be paid for. Because how many times, I mean, think about it, Sean, how many times you know people in your own circle, probably somebody passed away and somebody inherited a house, and then two years later you hear they lost the house or they blew all the money. It happens all the time. It's just because of a lack of education. So that's when I really started harping on education, and I just took those lessons I learned working on Wall Street, working with the affluent client. And I started having those conversations with everyday people to try to get people to change their mindset. How? It made me change my entire mindset where I had to go out and get life insurance. I had to set up wills. You know, as I started <clears throat> having children, I had to make sure I had these things in place because God forbid something happens to me. I want to make sure that my, my, my children and my family good because at any given time it can happen. So, um, you know, it's a lot of lessons over my 18 years, but everything that I talk about right now is kind of is my mess right my mess is my message and 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 i hope people are really listening and paying attention and hopefully it will help people um you know create generational wealth for their families no nah, i love you touched on so many great points i don't even know i know my bad i'm rambling my bad nah, i get kind of hype when i'm talking you, about this you stuff, know man. something matt you were touching touch because t- typically i would jump in and out but i was like l- let them go because you're touching on so many great points you know, part of it was conversation that we had offline. So maybe I'll just start there where we were talking. And this is something I really try to get across on my program. It's unfortunate for us as African-American and brown people. We're one, maybe two generations into making real money. So mm-hmm. the need in our community to ever be financially educated, it just was never there. Most of the people who we saw who made money they wore it on their wrists. They wore it on their back in terms of their clothes. But they never owned anything. You can right. see the biggest drug dealer in the hood driving, you know, some of the best cars and went home to an apartment. He was paying rent. Absolutely. 
what you're doing, I think, you know, touching on these points is so, so important to help change the mindset of our people. I also want to go back a little bit because we were talking about different um, <clears throat> loan types. Mm -hmm. Talk about FHA. That's typically yeah. for your first time home buyer. Is there a difference between an FHA 203K? I think yeah. that's what you call it. So a 203K is a FHA loan, but it gives you the ability to rehab a property, right? So FHA will give you the rehab money. So if you go, if you want to go buy a foreclosed property, a short sale, um, even if you want to just go buy a regular house from a regular homeowner, right? But maybe they got a pink, a pink bathroom and the kitchen is, is terrible. You can use the FHA 203K loan where you get the mortgage and the rehab money all in one loan with a low interest rate and you're able to rehab that house um, to your liking. Um, so it's a phenomenal loan. Requirements minimum right now the requirements about a 640 credit score and you can put down as little as 3.5% of the purchase price to purchase that home and get the rehab money as well. So it's a great tool um, for someone who's looking to do rehab. So let me make sure I got this clear and I want to make sure my, my, my audience understands. Mm -hmm. FHA loan. That's if Sean goes out, he's buying a, a, a property, maybe it's my first time. I'm assuming it is not for me to use as a, um, a rental um, property. I'm living in it. You can, you can buy one to four family properties with FHA. Now, if you buy a multifamily, two, three, or four unit property, mm -hmm. you have to live in one of the units. Okay. And they allow that. But if you want to buy strictly investment property, you have no intent of moving in, then no, you cannot use FHA for that property. Okay. And the FHA 203K, that is my loan. And it also has money built in for rehab. Correct. Okay. Talk, talk to me about Fannie. You know, we, we, we hear about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Okay. What's the difference in these conventional loans as opposed so, to FHA? So with Fannie it's a little, it depends on different products. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, are, are the agencies, the government agencies that, that pretty much buy mortgages from lenders, from banks, right? Um, both their guidelines are similar, so to speak. They may have little quirks here and there between the two of them. And as a loan officer, like we know this stuff, but for the general public, I ain't going to get too deep into that because I don't want to go over nobody's head, but for the general public, you know, conventional loan, minimum 620 credit score, you can buy one to four family properties. Um, you can buy second home, vacation homes with conventional mortgages, and you can buy investment properties with um, conventional mortgages. Your minimum down payment could be anywhere from three to 5% for a single family. And for multifamilies, depending on the program, it could be anywhere from 5% to 25% to for multifamily. Okay, so, so stop there for a second. Always mm -hmm. heard, you know, and obviously I bought properties, but I'm playing dumb. Always mm -hmm. heard you have to have 20% down. You just mentioned 3 to 5%. Correct. What, Correct. What, what, what products are that, that someone would only need to come to the table with 3 to 5%? Any product that's going to be for your primary residence will always require a minimum down payment between 3 to 5%. Right. Once you say vacation home or second home or investment property, that's when you need to put down more money. Now, when you put down three to five percent, especially if you're going for a conventional loan, when people say, hey, you should put down 20 percent when you buy your home, they're, they're really saying that. So that way you avoid paying PMI. Right. So PMI is private, private mortgage insurance. And that PMI is insurance that protects the lender in case. The, the buyer defaults on their mortgage. Now, the buyer has to pay that monthly fee. Now, depending on your loan amount, you know, in New York, I mean, PMI can be four, four to $800 extra a month just depending on your loan amount, right? It can get very expensive. But what I tell people this all the time, and I actually, I told Angela Yee this too, I said on The Breakfast Club, PMI is not the devil, right? PMI gives you the ability to put less down, keep more money in your pocket, and, be, and as long as you can afford the mortgage, I don't think PMI is a terrible thing. Because for me personally, right, if I'm buying a half a million dollar home and it's going to require 20% down, that's 100K that I have to put down for this house, not including the closing costs, which will probably be another 25, 30,000. So I'm all out of my pocket, $130,000. Mm -hmm. Now, if I put down, let's just say, 
10%, which will be 50,000, plus the closing costs another 25. Now I'm 75,000 out of my pocket. So I'm saving myself about 50, 60,000. And if my PMI payment is $400 a month, you got to think about 10, that's $4,800 a year. So in 10 years, you know, that's $48,000. It would take me to get that money. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'd rather keep my, my 30, 40,000 in my pocket. So that way I can go ahead and now put that money and deploy it like little workers and go make me some money. Now, if you can afford to do that, then that's the strategy I would recommend. But if you, if you're one of those folks and different strokes for different folks, right? Right. Some people just don't want to see PMI. They don't care. They feel like they're throwing away money. They rather save the money and put it down. God bless you. Do whatever works for you. You're the CEO of your business. You know, real estate is business, whether it's a primary residence or investment property. So you got to be a CEO. Make your decisions accordingly. It's just my advice. Me personally, I'm OPM, other people's money, brother. I don't want to spend my money. I don't want to spend it. I'm cheap. I want to spend your money. So if the bank want to charge me PMI, it's going to mean my payment's going to go up a couple dollars. So be it. I got my 30, 40 K because God forbid another COVID, a COVID 30 come right mm -hmm. now. We in quarantine. When I'm going to send my house, I, I, I need money now. You know what I'm saying? So I'd rather have that money sitting somewhere or deployed, making more money versus all in my house. And I can't get it out right away. So me personally, I want to go. I'm oh, sorry. What'd you say? No, I said me personally. That's just me. Got you. There's a lot that I want to get out in this interview. I'm really using this kind of as a how to something where people who, you know, they have limited knowledge, but they do want to invest in the real estate, whether for them or, or a, a, a rental property, they can look at this interview and at least get the A, B and C's. Question for you. Mm -hmm. Are loan offices still necessary? And what I mean by that is you see so many of these online, um, lendingtree.com and this, that, and the third, you know, where you can bypass. Is it necessary to, to form a relationship with a loan officer? And if so, what's the best way to do it? Do I walk into my local um, bank branch? Like, how do I even form a relationship with a loan officer? Great question. Um, so you know I'm a little biased on this one, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I and I'll keep it. I'll keep it a buck, right? Do you need a loan officer? Hell yeah. It's very simple, right? You. It's like going to court and you trying to defend yourself. Although you can. Great analogy. Great analogy. It's not, it's not recommended too because you don't know the law. So you can go on Linden Tree. You can go to these computer sites and you can punch in your information. Great, you get you get a pre-approval letter, you go out shop for a home, and then now when you actually go submit your documentation, you get declined. Like, cause you put in the wrong information, right? There's there's so many guidelines, there's so many regulations in our business that if you're not talking to someone, then if it could come up at the 99th hour and kill your deal. And I've seen it happen. Now, there's been a lot of success stories where people lose using online platforms. They feel like it's better for them. They just want to buy their primary residence. They don't have no goals of investing long term. Great. They may not, they may, that may suit they need, right? But for the folks out there who are looking to build a real estate portfolio, you need a mortgage guy. You need a mortgage girl. You need someone who understands the ever-changing um, guidelines, the laws. How do you structure these deals to achieve your goals? You know, going to your local bank, I tell people this all the time. There's nothing wrong with going to the bank that you have money with, but understand that person works only with that bank. They're going to adhere to that bank's guidelines. And depending on what bank you're going to, their guidelines can be strict than what the rest of the mortgage companies out there are offering. So you want to be able to have a relationship with a mortgage person that can handle your primary residence, that can handle your investment properties. Hell, if you're looking to go buy some commercial properties in the future, you need to work with someone who's knowledgeable. That way, anytime you have a question, like, all right, let me call my guy. Let me call my girl because I got this question real quick and I know they can answer it. Most of the times, if you go online to an online lender or you go into your local bank, that person or that online platform is only interested in that one transaction you're talking about. If you really think about this, right, if you go talk to a loan officer and anybody in your audience can do this, if they don't actually what your real estate goals are, they're really out for your best interest. 
right? They just want to know about this one deal that's on, on the table right now because we have quotas we have to meet. We are commissioned salespeople. If we don't kill, we don't eat for the most part, right? So if you come into a bank and you say, hey, I want to get pre-approved, or I want to refinance, they're worried about that one application. How can I get you in and get you closed as quickly as possible so that way you're happy and I'm happy, right? Mm-hmm. Me, on the other hand, I'm more about the relationship. What's your short term? What's your long term goals? And now can I match up the products that meet your goals? Not just for deal one, but for deal 10. Because if you mess up on deal one, that can hurt you for deal two, three, and four. I've seen it happen many, many times before. And it's because people are not having that conversation. People got to build teams, Sean. You have to have a team. Like you can't, you can't be successful in anything without having a team. And in real estate, it's the same thing. If you know you want to do buying flips, right, you need contractors. You can't say, hey, I want to flip properties and you don't know no contractors. That's just, that just doesn't make no sense, right? Um, you you want to buy rental properties. Are you going to manage them? If not, do you know any property managers? Do you have real estate attorneys, right? Do you have life insurance? Because if you're buying these assets, now you need to protect those assets. Do you have a trust? Do you have an estate lawyer? Do you have a CPA, right? Very important. Right. Generational wealth and what people and, and, and I know I'm going on a rant, but people. Need and, to and, 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 and you're probably going over some people's head because <laughs> so, so just just, just go, go a little slower and break. Because yeah, I'm because because I'm, I'm hype right now. Yeah, because right? you're saying CPA certified public accountant. Just, just I want to make sure that, that the audience follows you. So CPA is certified public accountant. Right. You need these people in your life because they understand real estate taxes. One of the best things about real estate is the tax deductions. And this is why most people want to go out and invest because it saves you on taxes. But if you're not working with a professional who understands the tax laws, especially for real estate, then that can hurt you, right? That's, that's money for you and your family and part of your wealth. So long story short, you just have to build a team and your loan officer, your mortgage person is very important piece important. to building a team. Got you. It's a question for you. And, and, you know, Sean, I walk in, I'm lucky and blessed enough to meet somebody like yourself who is knowledgeable, has 18 years in the game. One of the first things I should be discussing is my long-term real estate goals. Correct? Is Correct. that what I heard you say? Correct. Okay. Say my long-term real estate goals is to have multiple properties, rental incomes. Number one, should I put this in my name? Should I put him in, in an LLC? Like, what would you recommend to people who would like, okay, I know I have to live somewhere. So I'm going to start off with maybe uh, three family. Does mm-hmm. it go in Sean's name or does it go into my company? And looking forward, how should I set up my portfolio? It depends on your capital, right? So if you're a first-time home buyer and you have – minimal capital, meaning money, right? You don't have, you may have a couple thousand saved and you have enough to do your first deal. That's going to go in your personal name and that's going to be an FHA loan, right? You're going to live in one of the units and you'll buy the multifamily there. After that deal, if now you you have some more money and now you want to continue to buy real estate, but you don't want it in your personal name, you have your LLC and you want to put in your LLC, you can do that also. It's just going to require a 25% down payment and now you can put that property into your LLC and it won't touch your personal credit. Stop right? there for a second. So mm-hmm. if I want to buy a crib for rental income purposes only, it requires a higher down payment. Correct. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you have a higher down payment, which will be about 25% of the sales price. So if it's a hundred K sales price, 25,000, mm-hmm. right? For that property. And you can put that in your LLC. Now, when you put it in your LLC, it's not in your personal name at all. It's all in that business name. How the does business, that protect me? Or well, why would I do it? You would do that because if someone wants to sue you, someone wants to, you know, someone trips and falls, something like that. They're not coming after, you know, Matt Garland personally. They're coming at 123 Main Street LLC. Are there any tax benefits for me for doing that? 
There are definitely tax benefits for doing that, but that's why I would tell you, you know, consult with a CPA um, for, for especially prior to you buying real estate because you want to know what the tax, tax benefits are if you are to buy a multifamily, a single family, if you are going to do construction, like how can you write all of this stuff off? So that's why I said earlier, CPA or a tax professional is very important to have a part of your team. Okay, let's take it backwards for a second because I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's dumb it all the way down. Let's do it. I, I, I walk in, I know the property I want to buy, match my loan officer. What documentation do I need? Oh, yeah. So documentation needed to get pre-approved, right? You need last two years of W-2s and tax returns. We need to see a two-year work history. Um, if you are self-employed or you, you receive 1099 income, 1099 income is, let's say you're a real estate agent or you drive an Uber, right? Yep. You get paid 1099. That is considered self-employed in the lending world. So we would need to see your tax returns. We would need to see 30 days of pay stubs if you're a W-2 employee, copy of your ID, Last two months of your bank statements, we need to see the money that you're going to use to purchase the home. Um, the money could be in a retirement account. Then we need to see the retirement account. We can get a gift from a family member. Um, copy of ID. So those are the Stop initial documents. for a second. Talk about gifts? Let's talk about gifts. Because a lot of people don't have that down payment. They typically will get it from somebody who has it, lends it to them. Maybe it's a mom. It's a dad. Um, maybe it's a spouse. Talk to me about the gifts. So gifts can come from a, a, a family member. Um, we just have to see the money coming from um, the donor to your account, right? So I would say this. Mattress money is a big thing in our world. So yes, those of you guys don't know who ma what mattress money is, is basically you have some cash under your mattress, right? Um, New York, we do susus a lot up here, right? Yep. That's, all, that's all mattress money. So you'll have a lot of people that would just want to deposit that money and say, hey, I'm going to use this to buy the house. So if that, that money is undocumented, we can't use it, right? So then that's when you probably have to go get a gift from your mom, your dad, or someone like that, your brother, your sister. We have to see that they have the money. So we're going to require one month of their bank statements to show that they had that money sitting in their bank account already. And then we have to see the money coming from their account into your account. And then you sign a gift letter, and that's that, right? But you can't try to be slick. You can't say, hey, I just got the susu for 30K. Let me give it to my sister. She deposits it and then gives me a gift. We're going to see that large deposit, and we're going to see. So now we can't use it, right? But gifts are, are more than welcome when you're doing a primary residence. Got you. Can you talk to me with, you know, I know you run with, 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 with Envy and Caesar and, and, and all of the, the, the guys who are really educating our community. They speak mm -hmm. so much about hard money lenders. Yes. We, we, explain, what, what's a hard money lender? Because that sounds like some mob guy with, with, with a sweatsuit on ready to break your kneecaps. What, what's well, a that, hard money lender? That's kind of how it was like 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yo, shout out to Envy and Caesar. Um, you know, they're definitely doing a great thing, man. Those are my brothers right there. But hard money lenders is basically private lenders. And, um, and they use a lot of hard money lenders for the deals that they buy. Um, and that's basically when you're buying in your LLC, right? You're buying in the LLC's name. You want to do a fix and flip home. You buy a home at an auction. You fix it up. The hard money lender will give you probably 90 to 80% of the acquisition price. So if the price is, let's just say $100,000, if they're want, if they going to give you 80% of that 100, that means you basically have to put down 20%, right? And then they'll give you 100% of the rehab money to fix up that house. Now, with a hard money loan, Sean, that hard money loan is only good for 12 months. After 12 months, it's a balloon payment due. You have to pay it off in full. So if you're going to take out a hard money, you have to make sure that A, you have an exit strategy. An exit strategy is, is that you're able to either A, sell that property to an end buyer to flip it, or B, have a, a, a asset-based lender that will still, that will refinance you 
out of the hard money loan. Okay, you just educated me on this one because I didn't know that. I want you to okay. stick to this for one second. Yeah, yeah. A hard money lender will lend you typically up to 80% Correct. of what the home costs. Correct. I'm assuming it's at a much higher interest rate. Interest rates can be right now. So let's speak on COVID-19, right? Yep. COVID-19, the hard money world, it took a, a, a beating, right? So if you are a new investor, you're going to probably have to put down 30% right now because you, you have no experience. For seasoned guys, they can get anywhere from 15 to 20% down. So the Envies and the Caesar of the world right now, they'll do 15, 20% down on their deals. Prior to COVID, they were doing 10% down uh, on their deals. Now, with that hard money lender, they're going to charge you interest rates anywhere from 11 to 15%, depending on the hard money lender. And they're also going to charge you points. Um, a point is 1% of your loan amount. So if they charge you three points, they're going to charge, that's $3,000 if you're doing a $100,000 loan that they're going to charge you as their origination fee, right? So it can get very expensive. You know, if you're doing a million dollar house, that can be, you know, $30,000 that you just have to pay that hard money lender. But it's a tool, Sean. It's a tool. It's a short-term solution. It gives the investor the ability to go out there to buy distressed properties, to rehab those dist distressed properties, and to flip them for a property, but also creating um, housing um, in, in certain neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great tool to use. I don't really harp too much on the interest rate too much because it's a short term solution because you're not looking to pay 12% for 30 years. It's just, it's just for that short term of one year. So this is for somebody who is looking to flip, basically, because after Absolutely. 12 months, they want their money. Absolutely. It's mainly for people who want to flip, but you can also use it as a way to buy and hold property too. So if you buy a multifamily from an auction and it's, let's say you buy a bando, it's burnt out, right? Mm -hmm. You need the money to rehab that, but you know you want to keep it for the long term of the rental income because the cash flow is there. So you'll get the hard money loan is perfect for that. So it'll give you the funds to acquire the property, rehab it, and then you refinance out of the hard money loan into something that's going to be um, fixed for a longer period of time, maybe five years, seven years, or 30 years, depending on what type of loan you're going to do. Um, so the hard money tool can be used for uh, uh, like a short term, like real short term, three to six months, and then you refinance out of there and get into something else. So mm -hmm. it's a great tool to use for investors. I mean, that's how Envy and Caesar have built up their portfolio. I think yep. Caesar's well over 1,100 units right now. Envy is close to 200. Um, and they've used these strategies that I'm talking about right now to build that up in a short period of time. Got you. Um, how would I, you know, I guess, but even before I get off that hard money lender, mm -hmm. does a hard money lender, do they go through the same protocol as a traditional loan officer, meaning checking credit, nope. word of mouth? Like, what are the qualifications there? So typically the requirements for a hard money lender, they want you to personally have, um, it used to be 620 score, but it rose to around 640 to 660, depending on the hard money lender um, during this quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, but typically 640 to 660 um, credit score, they're going to look at your personal credit just to make sure that you're not a deadbeat. You know what I'm saying? Because they're lending a LLC and they know people who have LLCs, you can walk away from that. So you personally, you're going to personally guarantee that money, just in case you try to walk away, they can come after you, but it won't appear on your personal credit. But with hard money loan, Sean, it's not like the traditional route when we need your blood type, your W-2s, your firstborn. With a hard money loan, if you have the money and your credit is there, it's an easy process. You can get closed in two weeks, 10 days. Really? You know, it's not, it's not, they're not, they're not looking for those W-2s, those tax returns, those pay stubs. They don't care if you're unemployed. They don't care if you have a job. They just want to make sure your credit is where it needs to be. And what's your level of experience is the most important criteria that they're looking at is your experience. Are you a rookie or are you seasoned? And if you are seasoned, where is your HUDs? Where is your settlement statements? Show proof of the transactions that you completed over the last couple of years. And that will ultimately determine 
your interest rates, and how much you're going to have to come out of pocket with to get the loan. Now, as you build that relationship with the hard money, and this is what I would highly recommend to everybody watching this, if they want to um, invest, build relationships with hard money lenders. The more deals you're doing with them, the more competitive they're going to come. As they see they're lending you money, you're paying them off, it's like anything. You got a credit card, right? You may start off with a high balance of 1000 you use it, pay it off, use it, pay it off. What are they going to do? Hey, congratulations. Here's 10000 now, right? You've been responsible. It's the same thing with private money lenders. And once you have those private money lenders that know that you are going to do what you say you're going to do and you execute, the world is yours as an investor from there. You can take over. So question for you. My last question in terms of, of, of the hard money lender. I know where to find you in traditional loan offices. Mm-hmm. Where do you even find these guys? Like, do they have offices? Is it back alley somewhere? Like, are, are, are they on, can you just go into Google and punch in hard money listed and, and a list of them come up? Absolutely. I mean, look, 15, 18 years ago, back alleys, right? All day. Now, Google's your best friend. You can Google your life away, hard money lender, in whatever county, town, city you're in, and you'll see a whole bunch of things come up. You can go to Instagram. You can go to Facebook. You can go to YouTube, Hard Money Lender. You can hashtag search, right? And you'll see a bunch of things out there. There's so many investors that are, are open with the knowledge of, uh, that they're sharing right now on all these platforms where, hey, you can just go on somebody's comments. Who's your hard money lender? You'll be surprised. They'll tell you, hey, this is who I use. Go work with them. And then you go to their page and you check out what they do and set up a consultation and, and, and have that conversation. But I will tell you, before you start having these conversations, be prepared, right? These folks are busy professionals, just like myself. The worst thing you can do for yourself is go into a conversation unprepared, having no knowledge, because they're not going to take you serious. Like when folks come to me and tell me they want to buy a home if they're a first-time home buyer, if they, have, if they don't understand certain lingo, I don't expect you to be an expert, but have a general idea. That's going to show me that you're serious about buying a home. But if you're trying to treat me like I'm your personal Google, I'm turned off. Because it's like the information is here at your fingertips. It's right here on your phone now, right? It's like it's impossible for you not to Google something and and learn about it and, and have some basic terminology so that way you can have an intelligent conversation. So I would highly recommend go to YouTube, go to, go to Instagram, go to these platforms, learn a little bit, so that way you can have that intelligent conversation. Okay, let's switch topics for a second. With the pandemic, there's been a lot of restrictions put in place, and there's been a lot of things out there to help um, the people who have taken loan. Explain to me the difference between forbearance, um, you know, is it forgiveness? In terms of, you know, because a lot of people stop paying their loan um, Mm -hmm. in deference. Like, what's the difference? Well, when you, the forbearance plans, it was kind of a mess when they first rolled out everything. Um, No one had really no clarity um, whether you're going to have to pay it all back in a lump sum, would it be spread out over time. No one really knew. Up until middle of May, I forget the exact date, when when the government came out and gave clarity, but they said anyone who took any covid 19 relief, and if their loan was owned by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, the government backed um, entities, that that money, that three or four months of payments, would not be due in July, right? You will have to, the bank that you pay your mortgage to, they will have to work out some sort of payment arrangement with you, and it wouldn't negatively impact your credit scores. Um, So that was a great thing that they came out with that gave people um, clarity. Now, there's a lot of loans out there that are not owned by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? You have a lot of private mortgages and things of that nature. Now, those folks, they don't follow the government. They can kind of tell you, hey, my money is due now. You have to pay me my money. Or, you know, we got to work out a loan modification. Now, a loan modification can report to your credit report in a negative light because that's the same um, it hits your credit the same like a foreclosure. Hold on, stop there. Stop there for a second. It's mm-hmm. important. A loan modification doesn't sound bad, but it will hit your credit report and affect it as negative as a foreclosure. Correct. Correct. Really? So a loan modification, a loan modification is not a good thing, right? Um, and the way they report it, I don't know. It, it's just it reads off 
like a foreclosure. It's a negative event. And even if you try to go do a refinance after loan modification, you have to wait a certain period of time. You have to wait a couple of years. Um, a seasoning requirement is what we call it. At least three years before you're able to do a refinance after that loan modification. Now, if you're doing a deferment because of the COVID-19, that's that's fine, right? Putting the money on the back end is some sort of deferment COVID relief program. Cool. It's not going to hit your credit in a negative way. But if it shows as a loan mod, that definitely can impact you in a, in a negative way. So I tell everybody, call your service and lender before you start making your payments. If you can't afford because you lost your job, um, you got sick or whatever the case may be, then you may not have no choice. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you don't have the money coming in and you need to take whatever help you can. And you can always repair your credit. Right. Having having your credit messed up is not a life sentence. You know what I'm saying? Like you can fix it. Um, so take it if you need it. But if you don't need it, I've been telling people all quarantine. Don't take it if you don't need it. You're better off making your mortgage payment. That way you don't get jammed up in the future. So just for my own clarity. Forbearance, deference does mm -hmm. not equal forgiveness. People no. are paying, at the end of the day, no matter when you start paying, you're gonna owe that money. Absolutely. Okay, got you. Absolutely. So if they say, okay, you, you can defer payment for the next three months. Do you still owe that money. Okay, but are they really expecting you three months later to come in with three months of mortgage payment? No, they, I, I think that was kind of crazy when they put it out there because it's uh -huh. like okay, after the three months, if you couldn't pay for three months, what makes you think you could pay four months at one time? It just didn't make, it's no, it don't make no logical sense. Correct. Um, but I can tell you from folks that I've been speaking to this month, a lot of the lenders have been helping folks, right? They've been putting this money on the back end, um, doing it as COVID-19 relief deferments, not as loan modifications. Um, and they're putting that money on the back. I know a couple clients that actually they agreed to payment arrangements. So what they did was they, they reinstated their mortgages. They got out the deferment and they started making their payments, but they had to pay a little bit extra every single month until that back in three months was all caught up. So it's kind of like anybody who's a homeowner, you know, if you get your escrow analysis every year, it shows your taxes. Uh, if they went up or not. And if you have a shortage, then you have to pay more to pay back the bank. It's kind of like that same thing. Um, so those plans have been definitely good um, for a lot of homeowners out there. They haven't been getting jammed up with their credit and their scores haven't been going down. And a lot of them now are going back to paying their mortgages. And in three months, after they make three months of mortgage payments on time, now they're eligible to do a refinance or to purchase a new home again which okay, is beautiful. a major plus. So it's a beautiful thing. Um, it helped a lot of people, but also, again, guys, contact the lender you pay your mortgage to to find out what their plans are before you accept any help because you need to know the pros and the cons to it. I just want to tap into something you said earlier. You said put it on the back end. Mm -hmm. Just speaking in ABC language, if you have a 15-year or 30-year now we're talking you have a 16 year or 31 year is that am, am i accurate in that they'll still keep the the term the same um but then what they're going to do is basically if you owe say that three months were ten thousand, right now your balance of your mortgage was a hundred thousand so instead of you owing a hundred now you're going to owe 110 Gotcha. And then, and they may have to. So you know, would that be similar to almost arrears? <laughs> like if, if you basically account, is that basically. it? Basically, okay, basically. And, 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 and I think a lot of our audience will get that, especially the, the males who are a little bit behind in their child support. Yes, like it's basically arrears. It's in arrears, basically. Got you, got you. Another. This is a question just off the cuff. Can you buy a loan? I mean, can you buy a home if you have an outstanding student loan? Yes, you can. So if your student loan is in default, right, you can't get a government loan, FHA loan. You have to take the student loan out of default and get into some sort of payment arrangement. Um, if your student loans are currently deferred because of COVID-19, or just deferred in general, right? A lot of student loans are deferred or, or, or are in income-based repayment plans. You yep. can still buy 
a home. Now, depending on the program, if you go FHA and you have student loans that are defaulted, I mean, not defaulted, are, um, um, deferred, then we're going to use 1% of your balance to use as the payment. So if, you're, if you have student loans at $100,000, right, and you have no payment, it's in deferment, and you go with an FHA loan, we're going to calculate that your monthly payment is $1,000 for that student loan, and we're going to include that into your debt-to-income ratio. Okay, stop there for a second, because it was a question I had coming up. Mm -hmm. Debt-to-income ratio. How do you calculate that? What should Ooh. people coming in to see you even be thinking about, you know, because obviously, let's say you're making great money, $65,000, $70,000 a year, but you have $50,000 in bills. Like, explain what debt, to, and I think it's self-explanatory, but explain it and explain how do you calculate debt to in income ratio? So debt to income ratio, AKA DTI is the main ingredient in getting approved for the loan. It's like the jerk sauce on a good piece of jerk chicken, right? <laughs> you need that jerk sauce, right? And if that jerk sauce ain't right, that chicken ain't right, right? So it's the main ingredient. Now your DTI is comprised of your, your gross monthly income. If you're W2, we're looking at your gross monthly income. Um, and we're looking at your monthly mortgage payment of the, of the house that you're looking to buy, you know, the monthly payment that's including the, the, the principal interest taxes, the property taxes and insurance, right? So if that monthly payment is $2,000, we'll use that as an example. And let's just say you have a car loan, you have credit cards, you have student loans. It could be $100,000, Sean. We don't care about the balance. We care about the payment. So if that monthly payment of all those debts, now this is only what's reported in your credit report. This doesn't include your cell phone bill, your utilities, your child care. It doesn't include any of that stuff. Oh, only that's right that you pointed that out. None of that is included into your debt to income ratio. Only what's on the credit report and we're using the minimum payments that's on the credit report, except for when it's deferred student loans, right? Now, let's just say that new house you're looking to buy is $2,000 a month, and those car notes, the credit cards, the student loans come up to $500 a month, right? So now you got $2,500 a month. Now, let's just say you're making $5,000 a month gross, right? Now, if the, if the program requires a 50% max debt-to-income ratio, it's very simple. 5,000 divided by two, that's 50%. That equals $2,500. But So now your new mortgage payment plus the, the minimum payments on your credit report can't exceed $2,500 a month. Guess what? The house that you're looking to buy plus those minimum payments equal up to 20, 2,500. So you're right at 50% debt to income ratio. So that's a simple way how to calculate your debt to income ratio. If you go to my YouTube channel, um, MG the Mortgage Guy, I have a whole video on, like I actually took an hour and I broke down like everything that the lender looks for with the DTI. But also on this topic, Sean, I want to say this, because this is very important. Eligibility doesn't mean affordability, right? Lenders one more time. Will, Say that one more time slow because I, I feel like you're about to go someplace. I'm about to go somewhere, bro. This may be a little bit of a rant right now, right? <laughs> but eligibility and affordability are two different things, right? What you're eligible for, what we just calculated was off your gross income. That's how lenders look at you, gross. That's not what you take home. That is before taxes. So if you make 5000 gross a month, month, you're making, you're probably bringing home 3000 a month. And if your new mortgage payment in your bills that's on the credit report comes up to $500, that means you have $500 left over. Now, what about childcare? What about food? What about cable, Wi-Fi, Netflix? You know, you can't even go out and smoke hookah. <laughs> if you, you, got, you got car insurance, right? You got all of this stuff that you still have to account for, clothes, you know, dry cleaning, laundry mat. But if you only have $500 left, then how are you taking care of this, right? That's not affordability. 
So if you if the lender is requiring a fifty percent max debt to income ratio, does it mean you you should still buy that home at a fifty percent debt to income ratio just because you can get a loan for it? No, you can't afford it, right? You may be eligible, but you can't afford it. So that's a recipe for foreclosure in my eyes. And a lot of people are still going to buy homes at that ratio because they may have, you know, someone living in a house, they plan on renting this, whatever the case may be. I just want people to understand there's a difference between eligibility and affordability and don't be house rich and cash poor. I love that. I love that. Say I'm a person who has low credit. I keep hearing you mentioning 620, mm -hmm. um, just in the sixes. Is there anything I can do to take advantage of these low interest rates right now? Uh, yeah. If you, if you have low credit, the good thing about someone who has, let's just say it's 620 credit score, you still can get a good rate in the low 3% right now. Right? Say, say, say I have a, a, a 600 credit score. If you have a six, at 620. So if you add a 600 credit score and you find a lender that can do an FHA loan at 600, right now you're probably going to be in the mid threes, maybe that's high three. Very low. That's incredible. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> like, still very low. That's, that's incredible, right? Just prior to COVID, people who had 750 credit scores were getting in the mid threes, right? Prior to COVID. So now today in COVID, in our COVID world, if you have that low credit, you can still get something below 4%. It's incredible opportunity for those folks. Now, I always tell people this, and if you have low credit, but you may have the money for down payment, you have the, the you can afford the home, don't wait till you have that 700 score, in my opinion. Go out and buy, right? And I say that is because the market doesn't care about your 700 credit score. The market moves every single day. Here today, gone tomorrow. We wake up today, the rate is, is 2.75. Tomorrow, it could be 3.75. We don't know. The market moves that fast. So it can take you a couple months to get to the 700 credit score. But what if in that time, and it's a what if, in that time, the rates go up. Now you waited for that 700 credit score. What did you really save? Because now you still got the same rate you would have probably received three, four months prior to because the rates went up a whole percentage point. So you didn't, and, and now the home prices, well, the home prices continue to adjust. So you may pay 10, 15, 20,000 higher in price, depending on your market, because you waited. So there's always an opportunity cost when you're waiting, right? My thing is all about execution. If you got it, go for it and get it. Got you. You know, I got a couple more. I could talk to you about this all day long. Um, you know, I got a couple of questions before we wrap. Okay. You know, should I go out today mm -hmm. and buy a home? Or are you expecting, I know you said that the market, you know, it stayed up. Mm -hmm. But I got to believe, you know, people are going to be defaulting people are going to to homes are going to go in foreclosure six months from now should i wait this thing out should i you know think logically like look if people can't pay them that you know the pack those back three four five months um mortgage that house is going to be on the market i might might as well wait this out and the interest rate i know you said the interest rates they change every day but do you anticipate them going up in the next few months um, my honest opinion is I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. Um, do I think they will go up in 2020? No. Right. Um, coronavirus is still spreading rapid. Um, so I think the government is going to have to keep buying bonds to keep rates low and keep the market and economy going. Um, so I don't think interest rates are going to be uh, are going to go up anytime soon. I think we got a couple months. But will I tell people to wait? If you're in a position where you can be patient and there's no need for you to buy and you can sit back and like kind of like hunt like a lion and kind of like in the trees and wait for the right prey to come, then by all means, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. But I will tell you this. I don't think there's going to be a big foreclosure wave that people think it's going to be. 
And the reason why I say that is because the government has stepped in and bailed out everybody this time around. They're bailing out corporations. They're bailing out small business owners. They're bailing out, you know, everyday homeowners. Everybody's getting a, a bailout right now. So those folks who were, you got to really think about it. There were uh, a line of people waiting to get foreclosed prior to COVID-19. The mm -hmm. court systems are still shut down pretty much everywhere in the country. So those are the first people who are going to get foreclosed on. If anybody's going to get foreclosed, it's going to be those folks who was in line. The folks who were affected by COVID-19, I don't see those folks getting foreclosed. I don't see a judge foreclosing anyone who comes to court and say I was sick or I lost somebody. I don't see that happening. That's a great point. I, I just don't see it happening. Like, it's, it's a PR nightmare, right? So I think there's going to be so much more relief to come in 2021 for those folks who are truly impacted by this. We might not see foreclosures from this COVID-19 thing until 2022 to 2023, right? You just don't know. Now, there will be casualties of war. There's always casualties of war. Shit, I was a casualty of war when the, the, the Great Recession came around. I got foreclosed on. I short sell homes, right? Because I, I was just uneducated. I was house rich and cash poor, right? So there's always going to be folks out there that's going to lose their house and, and, and have to do a fire sale. And that's when you have to be ready to, to, to execute. You got to have your ducks in a row. You got to have your financing. You got to have your team in place. You got to be able to strike while the iron is hot because there's, you're not the only one hunting. There's a lot of hunters out there. So be prepared. But I don't think there's going to be a wave, Sean. I just don't. I don't, I don't, I don't feel it. I feel like there's going to be more bailouts. You know, that's great news because you go back 10 years ago, um, 12 years ago, when everybody was losing their homes. Um, I'm glad the government's stepping up this go-round and really helping people out. That's great news. Well, um, think about it, because the government didn't want to help back then, because they blamed the banks. Correct. They didn't, you, who can you blame for this? I mean, we see who Trump wants to blame, but, like, really, who can you really blame for this? This is uh, like... It's an act of God. This is an act of God, bro. It's a virus. What can you... You can't fight this, right? You can't even see it. So how do you blame someone who got sick and their spouse died? They lost their job. Their business went out of, out of business because of, of this, because they couldn't open up shop. How can you foreclose on someone like that? I don't see it happening. Like, I, that's just me. I think, I don't think it's going to happen. 28, 29, 2010, different, different world. The banks, we were greedy. The appraisers were greedy. The brokers were greedy. The, everybody was greedy. So they didn't want to bail out the general public. But now everybody's going to get bailed out, bro. And your and your business is really continuing to boom throughout this recession. Busiest I've been in 18 years. Record breaking year. Unbelievable. Record breaking. Unbelievable. I can I'm a smile at one. <laughs> Record breaking. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this just goes against conventional wisdom. I, I would think right now you'd be sitting home with your feet up, twiddling your thumbs, like oh, I'm waiting for this phone to ring. Nah, brother. I mean, think about it. Look at the stock market, right? Stock market's crazy. If you know how to play the game, you make. I'm making money, and I don't even know how to how to work the stock market like that yet, right? But I've been learning during um, quarantine, right? Learning the stocks, learning options, learning all this stuff, and now I'm making money in 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 a in a um avenue, an investment avenue that I never thought twice about. I had no clue about stocks. I don't even want to pay attention to them. I have a four hundred one k, and really didn't pay it too much mind. I just put money into it until I really started doing a deep dive into it and learning. And now that I'm learning stocks, it's incredible, right? So you see the stock market go down, but you you see people all over the internet making tens of thousands and millions of dollars in the stock market right now. It's not, nothing's, this is unprecedented times. Like nothing's normal right now. And it's, look, you can't waste a crisis. You got to get to it. Matt, thank you so much for your time. You have provided invaluable wisdom. You know, I can't wait to release this. Um, where, where, where can people find you? Right now you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, MG the Mortgage Guy. Um, that's where you can see me. You can find me uh, on tour with DJ Envy um, and Caesar flipping New Jersey, or you can find me um, with my Earn Your Leisure, 
my Earn Your Leisure team, a part of EYLUniversity.com. I'm, I'm teaching classes there every single week on financial literacy. Um, so that's kind of where you can find me. Um, a lot of content on my YouTube page. So if you guys want to learn about real estate finance and just go MG the Mortgage Guy YouTube page, check out the playlist. The playlists are broken down by mortgage education, mortgage programs. So you can really go there and learn a lot. And um, hopefully I can help you guys achieve your real estate goals. And Sean, thank you again, man. I really appreciate this. Um, you you are definitely a legend. And um, being on this platform definitely meant a lot for me, man. And this was a great conversation. Again, thank you, man, for having me here. Nah, you know, and, and thanks so much for your time, Matt, you know, and, and your willingness to share. You were provided just like so much in like I said earlier, it's just invaluable wisdom. Um, and I appreciate you. I truly do. If anybody has not been to your um YouTube channel, I highly suggest they go MG the mortgage guy. You 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 break it down so nicely. And I tried to do it in a way kind of like you do it, where you're just talking to average Joe person who doesn't know too much about this side and you break it down in a way that anybody can learn. So go check them out at MG the Mortgage Guy. Matt, thank you again. You are a true power move maker. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Love. Love. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.